Okay. If buying apartments, you have to check one check. Who's going to be renovating apartments here, by the way? You can definitely make great money renovating apartments. Okay, so guys, if you are going to look at apartments, you have to, one of your checks before you buy the property is that you must check how active the strata body is. Now, the strata body is just a group of owners. Um, so let's say if you've got 12 apartments in a block, they normally have two or three owners who basically are on the corporate body. And what they do is they manage the affairs of the building. So buildings have to undergo maintenance. Um, the lift might break in, so somebody has got to look after that. So one way to tell what you want to aim for is a fairly um, to buy an apartment in an active strata body and how you you tell how active a strata body is is by how regular the minutes of the meeting are if they ha only take minutes of meeting once a year it's not a very good very active strata body if they're taking minutes sort of once every month or every um, by month then it means they're a fairly active strata body so just keep in mind that you are going to be not be able to do anything externally to the building if renovating apartment all the work has to be contained within all right, if you're looking to renovate apartments, my ideal scenario, guys, is to try and stay to small boutique blocks, where, blocks wherever possible. Don't ever go into these big developments where you've got two, three, four hundred apartments at any one time. What you want to aim for is small blocks, boutique blocks of basically 12 apartments or loss, less. Um, a classic example, Bondi. You know all the, the two-storey two walk-ups? You go to Bondi and they've got basically two level buildings and four apartments, two on the bottom, two on the top. They are the most beautiful apartments to renovate and certainly one of my students has been renovating those apartments in Bondi and doing very, very well um, because what it is, it's a scarcity factor. You don't ever want to go into larger apartments, larger developments because I guarantee you at any one point in time there's always going to be two or three apartments within that apartment block to buy. So you want, it's all about uniqueness, the scarcity factor. So when you go into those smaller blocks to renovate, A, they're more boutique and B, you, have, you are very unlikely that you're going to ever have have two apartments on the market at the same time. So then buyers don't, can't play you off against other ap apartments in the same complex. Okay, does the property have parking issues? Look, parking, um, parking is a requirement. However, it's a requirement in certain suburbs. And this comes back to your, your suburb due diligence. What is the expectation for the housing? Remember I said yesterday, you've got to work out what are the requirements for a housing, whether they need a formal dining room. Is, it, you know, is that required? The same with parking. So in the inner city locations, um, a lot of buyers overlook parking. Like they don't, it's, on our, it's on their wish list, but most often people don't get parking, so they will just forego that. But there are certain values of property, like in Balmain, for example, anything, any property that is over $2 million in parking, you, uh, over $2 million in value, sorry, you have to have at least one car off street parking. Properties that are sort of like 500 to a million dollars, even properties up to you know, $1.5 million, if it doesn't have any parking, buyers would love it, but it's not an issue, okay? People overlook it. So parking is definitely one thing that you need to be mindful of. Sometimes you don't have any off street parking, but if the street has good parking, that would be fine. So a classic example, when we go through the Leichhardt site on Tuesday, and, and next week, basically you'll see that that property only has one car off street parking, um, but the street is fantastic for parking. You can always get parking any day or night. Now, when, I, when most, of, most of you are coming out to that site inspection, yeah? Yeah? Great. And so when I bought that property, the agent said there was four car off street parking on that property. I'm like, what, if you drive a Mini or something or a Vespa, um, so the reality is, yeah, the backyard could fit four very tiny cars, but you can't even open your door in the driveway. So unless you're really skinny like me, you basically slither out your, your car door like this. Now, is that practical? So you've got to be careful with those real estate agents brochures, determine what's facts from fiction because real estate agents are only doing their job. They're just trying to sell, pitch the property in the best possible light. But it's your job as, as professional in property investors to make sure what you're really buying. So parking, definitely check that. So in the inner city locations, buyers will be more willing to forgive that depending on the value of their property. When you move into the out into the metropolitan suburbs, that 10 to 75k ring, parking is an absolute um, priority. Um, it, your properties must have parking, and obviously in the regional areas, it's not it's a non-issue. Parking they've got plenty of areas. Now in some suburbs, when you're dealing with those metropolitan suburbs, there are some expectations that you must have a double garage. 
okay? So you have to know what is the expectation in your particular suburb, what is the expectation? Because you don't want to go and do the best renovation internally only for an agent to say, well, Cherie, um, you know, there's going to be less demand for this property because you've only got a carport when literally 80% of the houses in this suburb have a double garage. So do you want to see what I'm saying? All right, so simple little check. Um, with structural um, building, I know in Melbourne anyway, in, for example, Carlton, they won't give you a permit unless you have a car spot for... Like, for example, if you took a two-bedroom to a four, you've got to have two cars. It's part of the, the thing. Is that something you've heard about or...? Well, it depends. If you haven't got the space, it's going to be hard for them to impose that condition. So mm. I guess most councils would like to get cars off the street, but it's not always practical. So yeah, yeah. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure there you're not, you wouldn't get the permit if you just try and put two more bedrooms. There's going to be more people in there and you haven't provided car parking. They won't approve it. So um, it's, I think it's just in very tight inner it will, areas. It will, yeah, it'll come, it, definitely mm. in, in a city location. So again, it's, it's, get, it's getting to know what is the requirement in your particular suburb. Did, it, did most of you get that, DC, that development, that LEP, LEP, DCP? What does that mean to me? Um, all right, did, it, did you all get that yesterday? Anybody not see that? Want to see it? Oh, half the room. Okay, guys, um, Jules, could, would you mind just getting it from the front here and make sure that goes around? So that's why I'm saying that, that LEP, DCP, which is typically one document, that would spell out what all of those requirements. So as a professional developer, you're going to go in, you're going to basically see what the requirements are, and that can help you pinpoint properties where you can overcome that sort of stuff. All right. Um, does the property suffer from a lack of privacy? So... You can have the best unrenovated property, but if you've got a three-storey ugly red brick apartment block right next door, is that a buyer objection that you can overcome? Yes. Lack of privacy? No. Not really. Okay, you might be able to get creative and put some sage shale or whatever, but at the end of the day, privacy is a big thing for buyers. So you have to work out, as part of your property due diligence, make sure you always look at the surrounding neighbours to the left, to the right, and also the back and work out whether privacy is going to be an issue. Okay, is the property positioned on the low side of the street or the high street? Basically, properties that are positioned up high are called high-set properties. When they're positioned just slightly below the street level, they're called low-set. Which properties do you think have lower value? Low-set. Low okay, so your objective is to always buy properties at least on a level playing field, on a, on a level block of land, okay? That's what you want to aim for. It's not to say you don't buy any properties on a slightly um, sloping block, that's fine, okay? But what you don't want to be doing is buying properties that are basically on, on a, like a side of a cliff, okay? Because from an excavation point of view, that's going to cost you quite a lot of money. Now, properties on the low side, this is, um, a, people absolutely hate properties that are below street level. They also have a higher incident of water problems, so rising damp and things, because when it rains, water just naturally falls to the lowest points so you'll find some of those properties that are just slightly below street level they only have to be below street level this much okay but they still will a lot of people won't buy properties that are basically like that a good example is if you go to number 18 Bradford Street Balmain that's one of my very early renovations um, I actually sold the property so I was fortunate in that regard but it did that property did take a little bit longer to sell purely for the fact that it was slightly below street level. So you can see it's only a marginal difference at the street level, but um, obviously a lot of people don't like that. So definitely try and aim for a level block. Okay, so a sloping block of land. So when you're dealing with uh, sloping blocks of land, you've just got to consider the cost of backfill and excavation. Um, also, when sloping blocks of land, you've got a block of land that's, that's like that. And it, you know, it might go like that or whatever, and it might go up at the back here, and you want to come in and potentially might have a house um, you know, up here, whatever. And you might want to come in, you might want to put an alteration in addition to the front. A lot of people overlook doing alterations and additions to the front of the house as well, so don't always write that off. Um, so if you're coming to do, you know, you're going to have to basically come in and you might have to cut it back here, whatever, whatever it may be. But excavation is pretty expensive. Um, you're paying basically for the fuel for the truckload. When they actually excavate soil, it for some reason it also fluffs up as well. So it's very, um, well, that's not the correct term, fluffing up, but um, <laughs> it, it does something. It aerates or something, it aerates and basically yeah, it bulks up. So you can, um, you can be excavating a site and you'll think it's only like two truckloads of backfield to be taken out and it turns out to be 10. So um, I, one of the projects that I did last year at Pimble, um, 
I are really grossly underestimated because I'm normally t used to dealing in the inner city locations where you're not really taking out a lot of soil. And I estimated about 20 truckloads and it turned out to be 75. <laughs> So it just went on for weeks and weeks. And I was just like, where are all this stuff coming from? So, yeah. And you've got to be really careful with excavators as well. Um, I hate saying that because my dad is an excavator. But with the, a lot of excavators, what happens is they charge you by the, the t um, basically a truckload. So you get all different tons of trucks. Um, and quite often, they, a lot of excavators, they don't fill you. So they'll, they'll charge you to a truckload, but they don't fill it right to the top. So you sort of have to monitor that as renovators because even if they just drop it down, you know, even the slightest amount, over 10, 20 truckloads, that can be additional expense. Any, any comments in that regard? Or any, tip? uh, any tips? Usually, well, I'll, work on so I'll grab the microphone. I, like, I work on an hourly basis, so, but I'm, like, I'm a truck driver, like I do yes. the tippers. Yep. But um, mainly, like, you fill it up and you get tip dockets at the tip. Yes. But there's a maximum. You have to be 22 and a half tonne. Yep. That's all you can drive with in Sydney. Yep. So you put it on, like, the tip docket. It'll show what you got on there. Yeah, so, so you've got to be careful on that. You've got to make sure because, they put um, it on there, but you can't go So they've got, the those, maxim they got those maximums. So mm. people will come out, they'll, they'll have a bigger truck, but they're, they're capped at a certain tonnage. So that's why the truck's not being filled, but they're still charging you for the whole truck load. Yeah. So you've got to ask them what the tonnage of the truck is and what the maximum. So you can really get tripped up on that. Because I've been tripped up on that. Yes, the rain. The rain as well. So it bulks it all up. So you've got to be careful with things. That's where you can incur a lot of additional expenses, renovators. Okay, is the property located in proximity to public housing? So you definitely don't want to be okay to be buying properties next to individual housing commission. As I said, every suburb has housing commission houses, so you, that's the reality of life. Um, but what you don't want to really be doing is buying in when they're all conglomerated together in one massive big housing development. In fact, I'll quickly flick back to, you know, that aerial picture? I'll show you where the... Um, see this one here? So that's the property that I bought... Um, and you know, as I said, that's a great property. This is, Mort Street is one of the best streets in Balmain. It's a blue chip street, a blue chip street that has housing commission located in it. Um, I bought this property. I think this was my thir third or fourth property. Very early in my first year, I bought this um, property or second year. Um, all the housing, see this whole block here? Housing commission, the whole lot. So, <laughs> and it's next to the waterfront park. Yeah, so I used to get annoyed, I'm like, oh, I'm paying like $2,000 a week mortgage and they're paying like $50 a week. But anyway, um, it's all right. So, you know, it's even like, you know, the Sydney Harbour Bridge here, you know, that big tower right next to the bridge or Housing Commission. So some Housing Commission properties are located in the most blue chip areas. Um, luck of the draw for those folks. But yeah, so you just got to be careful. I've noticed that um, I did actually live in this property very early on when I bought it and um, always, always seeing just things. Um, I don't want to generalise and I don't want to offend anybody, but I was just seeing things and, you know, police were always being called around and all that sort of stuff. So you just got to be very careful of, of public housing. All right. Does the property have any overhead electricity lines? Now, this is a biggie, guys. If your property has, and I'm not talking about normal power, point, uh, power poles, I'm talking about the big lines that run from paddock to paddock. Not an issue in the inner city locations. In some, in some uh, metropolitan suburbs, that 10 to 75k ring, you will get the overhead power lines. And this is particularly prevalent for anybody who's going to be renovating in the regional areas. You don't want to be in any proximity. I'm not talking about next to one or like underneath one. Even like two, three, five kilometres back, you want to be far away because everybody, when, they, when you say overhead electricity lines, what do they think? Brain cancer, leukemia, um, you're going to be sitting there watching your television, it's going to be going, like all sorts of things, right? People, that, no, no, don't go there, don't, don't buy, it doesn't matter if it's the best renovation opportunity in the world, don't go there. It's a major buyer objection you can't overcome. Okay, does the property have any evidence of fibro asbestos? Be careful when you're buying fibro houses, this is particularly prevalent in what region? No. Country. 
Country has a lot of fibro asbestos houses. Now, if you're coming in and doing cosmetic renos to a fibro house, it's perfectly fine to keep it like that. Um, fibro is only d um, dangerous when you actually break it and the particles get released into the air. Um, so it's a very serious thing. My, my grandfather actually died of asbestos um, working on the wharves with James Hardy and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, um, so it, it does kill people. That's the reality. Um, so it's... It is only dangerous when it's broken, so it's perfectly fine to come and paint it. Um, quite often, though, buyers will get a building inspection, and basically, if they get told that it's asbestos, it's fibro, um, fibro asbestos, then it's, it's, it can be definitely a buyer objection for some people. So asbestos is a problem. Um, I have no issue buying houses that are asbestos, because for me, it's a problem that can be solved. Asbestos is about, depending on where you are, typically about $20 to $25 a square metre to remove. So guys, it's no amount of profit is worth being in a coffin for. So this is stuff you don't ever muck around with. You bring in the um, professionals, you grab your yellow pages, look under A, asbestos removal. There's a whole ton of um, companies that come out and do it. They come out in their white space suits, so they just basically put a plastic jumpsuit on that you know makes them look like they're from NASA, and they'll come out. They come out with big black plastic. They'll take the asbestos off. They dump it all in black plastic. They wrap it, they tape it, and they take it to a special... Um, waste station that takes asbestos and the problem is solved, it's eradicated. So one of my students, God love him, he uh, attended my workshop about oh, six or nine months ago, somewhere around there, one of my earlier, um, later workshops last year, went straight out of the workshop, bought a house in two days after the workshop and um, it's like, great, and uh, he said to me, uh, he rang the office and he goes, what do I do? I bought a house with asbestos and I went, <sighs> All right, um, where's the asbestos? Whole house. <laughs> All right, ah! So please, guys, don't do that. So um, he had to take every single, and it was a Katoomba. So he had to um, take, the whole house had to be stripped. So additional expense, so just really simple things, just quick checks, make sure you don't, don't falter in that regard. Okay, there's a, a question there. Um, just to say with the soil, before I play soil every day, yep. um, if you want to work out for sand, people in WA, it's basically whatever the volume is, plus add 30% for clumping. Okay. okay. And if it's um, clay, it's somewhere between 50 and 60%. So if you've got X volume, then add that percentage to it, and that's what you'll get. Okay, cool. Could you email that to me? <laughs> and we'll email it out to the first students. Good formula, thank you. All right, does the property have underground petrol tanks? Now, most of you would not realise that some properties have an underground petrol tank. Why would a property have an underground petrol tank? And I see if you're paying li listening this morning. Industrial. Industrial. So remember I said over time they used to have a lot of home-based businesses where they have big garage shed or whatever. This is particularly prevalent on uh, regional properties as well. So if your property has an underground petrol tank and the bank finds out about it, you go and put your deposit down and they find out there's an underground petrol tank, you basically, they will not lend you the finance and you will lose your deposit. So sometimes uh, a lot of properties that I've bought have got underground petrol tanks. In fact, my current project in Leichhardt has an underground petrol tank. It's only a small one. So needless to say, I made sure that got filled with concrete very, very quickly, all right? So um, okay to have a petrol tank, but you just got to make sure... You've got to check the survey, and where you find this out is normally on the survey. So sometimes you'll get a little, um, on the survey, you'll get a little, you know, you have your diagram of your house, whatever, and it'll be like that. Quite often the petrol tanks, if they are going to be located in your property, they're not in the house area, they're to the rear somewhere. So if you've had an old, sometimes you'll get like an old, gar you know, an old garage to the rear where you've got your driveway up the side. So always make sure that when you're doing your, your property, and this is one of the things you need to do in your property inspection, when you're doing your property inspection, make sure you look, you basically overturn everything. So try and lift up the flooring if you've got just old bits of ply or lino or whatever that people put in the garage. If you can lift anything up, it's worth just lifting it up and seeing what you're going to be looking for is a petrol cap, okay? So sometimes make sure you look around the back of the property, walk around, and if you can see anything in the ground for a petrol tank. Because the last thing you want to be buying is find out that your yard has a massive petrol tank like that buried under the backyard. Because the council, if you're doing it, where this is particularly prevalent, not so prevalent for a, a cosmetic reno, but where it's prevalent is if you're going to come in and build a structural renovation right there and you, yes, you bring your excavator in, they start digging and they go, boom, I've hit something and they start chipping away trying to work out what's that steel thing underneath and suddenly you've just discovered that you have an ancient tomb under your site. So um, 
always look at the survey. So sometimes it is very hard to pick that up. If it's not on the survey, then good chance the banks aren't going to find out about it. Um, but it's just one little thing you need to be conscious of when you're doing your property inspection. So they used to just put petrol, because they had a lot of home-based businesses, they used to put petrol in there and just suck them out. And particularly this is prevalent in sort of like country properties if you buy to renovate. But where that can become an issue is that over time the, the steel tanks or whatever they're made out of just corrode. And suddenly if they're, if they're still full, because at the end of the day people People die and stuff and things get left in them, whatever they may be. And where it becomes an issue is, is what you said is that um, here you might have this massive petrol tank and then suddenly it starts trickling or seeping in the ground to the neighbour's property and they come in and they, they're doing a structural reno and that it gets discovered that the land is contaminated. So those sort of quirky things can trip you up. So if you can try and identify it, be aware of this as, as, develop, as professional developers and good on you. Oh, hello. Um, I just wanted to mention the mobile phone towers yes. as well because we just looked at a site recently that um, we sort of just around the corner, yep. but it was very close to the backyard. But when you were looking at the street, from yeah. the street at the house, you didn't really notice it, but um, then you could see it when yeah. we looked on the Google Earth. Yep. And then we went back and checked and, and it was really quite big. So. Yes, absolutely, that's a good yeah. point. So Julie, could you add that please so I can add that into the manuals, mobile phone towers and also the trees as well. Okay, cool. All right, does a property sit in a street that offers pleasant streetscape? As renovators, you want to be, when you're doing your property due diligence, you want to make sure that your house is sitting in a, in a reasonably nice street. As I said, there's no point going and doing the best renovation in the world if you walk up the front door and you're living in the Bronx, okay? So do a quick, make sure that when any property that you're looking at buying, make sure you drive the street a few times, really have a good look at the houses and just the surrounding streets to make sure that pleasant streetscape. Do you know what I mean by streetscape? Does anybody not know what I mean by streetscape, be perfectly honest, yeah? Everybody knows what streetscape is? Okay, good. So you just want to make sure that all the housing are consistent style and film. We'll talk about this on site. Okay, is the general street accessibility to the property easy? Some streets, particularly in the inner city, um, are myriad of one-way streets. What's a classic sam uh, sample of a suburb where it's full of one-way streets? Here in Sydney. Yep, Hurstconville, Glebe, um, Newtown. Newtown has a lot. So to get to your house, you've got to drive around the block and go through this street. So um, one thing to be conscious of as professional developers. Okay, always in terms of must always conduct a building inspection on your property. Now, if you're doing a cosmetic renovation, always get a building inspection done on the property because it can be those little things that trip you up that cost you a lot of money, i.e. asbestos, okay? I've got another student who's doing a structural renovation um, and she didn't get a building inspection done and uh, she just took a shortcut. She got a little bit uh, emotionally, well, she just basically went, you know, property came up, it was $50,000 under market value. Um, she thought, great, I'm going to just go straight in. So she skipped some of her property due diligence that I basically taught her. So she was on the phone saying, Sharia, I got the best deal, $50,000, all the agents are jealous of me, blah, blah, blah. And I went, okay. Um, and so it turned out that she had $45,000 worth of asbestos. Now, she only had one little, um, one little, basically like a wall, only the size of that um, screen. So it wasn't much, it was just in one wall but it was the most toxic asbestos that you can ever get. So she actually had quotes ranging from 17000 to 45000 was the most expensive just to remove that little patch. And um, I didn't actually say it, I didn't have the heart to say it to her, but what I felt like saying, well, now we know the reason why you got the property $50,000 under market value. So she ended up paying $17,000. She was still a little bit up, but still, I said to her, why didn't you get a basic building inspection done? It's part of the system. So try and, like, even though these things are little niggly things, you think, oh, yeah, 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 they are important things, okay? Is it worth spending $300 for a building inspection? Absolutely. Be safe, not sorry. Okay, in terms of your building inspection, um, one thing you need to be careful of is just, you know, when you're doing your physical property inspections, make sure that the property hasn't got any visible signs of major structural cracking. Little hairline cracks are fine. They're problems that can be solved. But if the house has basically got a situation where it's like this, if you've got a wall and you're seeing cracks like this, all right, and there's a reasonable gap, or you just, it doesn't even go like that. If you've just got a wall and it's, you know, there's a reasonable gap, 
then it that means there's movement in the house and that means underpinning and stuff like that, okay? And that can be highly expensive. So the, you do these things when you're going through your physical property inspection and that's where you look at the floor, you look at the wall and go, oh, geez, there's a major crack there. So if I see a major crack in the wall, who would I be calling? Either a building inspector or getting the building inspection done and asking them to specifically look at that um, or a structural engineer if I want to go to that expense. Okay. Does the property have rising damp? Rising damp is basically water coming in, so it comes, starts coming up from the wall. So as renovators, um, this is, look, it's, it's not a major issue, it's a problem, it's like asbestos and contamination, and it, it's, a pro it's a problem that can be easily solved. But where you get rising damp is where you've got a wall, so that's, let's say that's the outside of the house. Quite often, just over time, you know, and rain, so our soil moves, so quite often, you'll get, and these are the f this is the floor area within your house, so quite often you'll get um, soil that sort of like does that, where it's pushed up against the wall. You might have like a garden bed here, okay? So soil is actually above, like on the outside, it's actually above the floor level. So when it rains, water comes in and it basically seeps down the wall or it actually just comes up. You might have soil down, you know, over here and it actually travels up the wall, sucks up the wall. So that's typically the reasons for rising damp. So rising damp, again, it can be expensive to finish and there's a whole myriad of solutions. You can get um, walls drilled and stuff compound filled and you can get special rising damp bricks, all sorts of things, but it is an additional expense. So you've got to make sure that your building inspector will pick these sorts of things up. And then you factor, if it does come back rising damp, that's fine. You just need to allow some costs in your financial feasibility to rectify those costs. Great. Um, just in relation to all these tests, do you recommend uh, putting them in as conditions on the contract of sale yes. subject to your own satisfaction? Yes. Or, or so what's the exact... I'm just interested to know the exact wording you use yep. on the contract so of sale. So when I put my offers in, subject to building and pest inspection. Yep, so do you say subject to your own satisfaction with those tests? I just say subject to building and pest inspection. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and the, the, offer, the offer templates that I've done for you already have that in there. So when you submit your offer templates, it's already in there as a condition. Yep. But yeah, just keep it simple. You, can, you could put subject to my satisfaction if you really wanted to, but I just always say subject to building and pest inspection, and most agents know what that means. Um, when you talk about the damp, some houses, um, mainly I know of in the suburb that I live in, Lane Cove, have old underground water pumps. Yep. Would that pose? Do you like? Would that be an objection to you purchasing that house? Or are they? Ex I haven't dealt with that personally, but are they exposed? No, or are they there's a cavity underneath the house, yep. um, and it's water. Basically, water comes in under the house and gets pumped out into the main stormwater drains. Okay. Um, and if it's an older house, they're really old pumps. Um, and obviously newer houses, they're yep. newer, I the guess. The rainwater tanks and things. Yeah. Um, no, that's fine. And again, it's, it's what comes back to your suburb. Is that accept acceptable in your suburb? So if it's a very common thing in your suburb, then it's fine. But if it's a rare thing, then that would be, a, for me, a slight buyer objection. So um, I would, uh, what I'd then determine is whether I can overcome that buyer objection, take that pump, take that tank out, and basically put a rainwater tank in. Um, so you just got to assess the severity of that according to your own. Can you see how, can you see how like, you can see like different people are raising different issues according to their different suburbs? And that's why it's really important to work out the style of housing and what is it, like what are the things that float your boat in that particular suburb? And that's a classic example particular to Lane Cove. Yep. Okay, conduct a building, and, uh, sorry, conduct a pest inspection. So everybody runs a mile with termites, correct? I love termites, okay? Because again, termites, if they've eaten away half a floor, like half the floor, who cares? Get a carpenter in, fix it in half a day, problem solved. So just make sure you know what you're dealing. Now, obviously, if the whole house is eaten away, that's a different story. Um, but, you know, th they're problems. It's just there's a cost associated. Yeah, how much does it kind of cost you versus the return? So a pest inspector will come through, they'll tap all the walls, all that sort of stuff. So building and pest, inspe uh, pest inspections cost about 300. Um, building inspections cost somewhere typically between three to 600, depending on what state of Australia. We're trying to do a deal which Ar with Archie Centre as well. They're quite good. Um, so hopefully some more details. Two little semis that I bought in Cameron Street, Balmain. Um, Originally, the owner wanted a million dollars, so I offered them a million dollars. And then basically what happened is the building and pest inspection reports come in, 20 pages long. Um, 
And I managed to negotiate a $40,000 discount uh, just on based on the pest inspection. Now, the reality is, guys, when you get a building and pest inspection from your properties, they are going to come back 20 pages long. Literally every building inspection. They pick up everything. Loose door handle. So you'll get this massive list and you'll think, crikey's. Oh, there's too much, but you've got, there's too much, I'm just not going to buy the property. So with my um, Wagga student that I, I referred to yesterday, she got a building and pest inspection done on that country property, and it came back like 20 pages long, and she said, Sheree, I'm not going to buy, there's too much wrong with the property. So I actually said, look, email the report through, we'll have a quick look through for you. And it was just really simple things like, you know, loose door handle, creaky floorboard in bedroom one, um, uh, s s a property floor sagging in bedroom three in left right hand corner and she said oh the sagging thing sounds major I'm not going to buy it for that reason I said look actually get a carpenter out and actually determine how much that's going to cost because it could be something fairly minor she actually got a carpenter out and it only cost her three uh, he said three hundred and fifty dollars just to fix um, basically some of the under underfloor bracing so um, you've got to look at those building inspections realistically and expect they will be 20 or 30 pages obviously if there's saying that half the house has moved and the, the foundations are completely shot, then, you know, it's a, a property that you're obviously not going to buy. But you've just got to look at those building and pest inspections objectively. I was just wondering, when you um, get someone to come out for the pest inspection and the well, building and pest inspection, and they uh, determine a problem, do you then have to organise some a, a tradie to look at it? Yeah. Before you. So if you, it's a major problem, like if it's a squeaky um, squeaky floorboard or a loose door handle, obviously not. But if it's something more major, it definitely pays to get a quote. Um, get some quotes to determine what the cost. Because reality is, renovators with um with you being inexperienced in construction, most of you you're not going to know those costs. So obviously, if you can try and get some quickly, that's where. Like if I was looking at a hot property and I got a building inspection done, I would basically call my tradie straight away and say, "Look, Tony, I need you to quickly come out." to tell me where I'm looking at buying my next deal. Can you quickly come out and basically let me know how much you think it's going to cost to fix this? So, so uh, are you usually there when the inspectors Yeah, there? yeah. I would encourage all of you, when you get your very first building and pest inspection done on your very first project, I would encourage you to be there and watch what they do because you will actually learn. Like You're going to find as renovators, you should be starting to watch everybody, your building inspector, your pest inspector, your geotechs if they come out because this is how you're going to learn how stuff really happens out in the real world. So watch how the building inspectors, what they do, what they look at. Watch at the pest inspections. They come out with a cane and they tap the walls and you can hear when they tap, when they tap the walls looking for per, um, termites, it goes like tap, 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 and then it'll go tup, tup, tup. Well, like, so they, they do all sorts of things. So, like, the, the sound changes with the taps, and you can tell. So they're really good things for you to watch and learn because this is how you're going to become. This is the reason why I became an expert at property because I've just basically been on site and I've been watched and I've learned over the course of the last 11 and 12 years. So I encourage you to do all of that. And yeah. yeah, talk to your tradies. So when you bring your tradie out, you may not know what the issue is. You may know there's an issue. You have no idea how to fix it. But that's where you bring your tradie out. Call a, call a tradesman straight up. Say, can you come out straight away and basically say, look, this is the issue, and, and ask them how would you, how would this, how do you think this should be fixed, and what are the costs associated with that? Because then they'll say, look, Cherie, the floor's sagging over there. What I need to do is I need to lift the floorboards up. I need to do this. I need to do that. You know, the probably costs are going to be like six hundred and fifty dollars approximately. So now suddenly you know how that problem can be fixed and that's how you increase your learning and are agents or vendors usually good with or yes. cooperative with they want to sell the property so of course if there's an issue they want to know how much it's cost because you know what they probably want to know how much it costs so they can tell the next person coming through who's potentially looking at the property so yeah they agents are quite good in that regard i've never had a situation where an agent has said no you can't go through a property to do a building and pest inspection for them that's a sign that you're a serious buyer just before i forget guys um one, one thing you just need to be careful of, when you're going to open for inspections, quite often the agent, particularly for inner city properties where there's a lot of demand, the agent will say, a good question to ask the agents is how many contracts are out on the property. Now the agents will say, especially on a, a good unrenovated property, they'll say, oh, there's approximately 15 contracts out on the property. They say that all the time. I follow up with that and I say, how many building inspections have been done? Oh, there's been no building inspections or there's only been one building inspection. And that will determine who's, who's the real players and who's not. Uh, I was just wondering, when you get the um, pest, building and pest inspe inspection and you're looking no, at... No, 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 I love that, love that flag for that tip. No? Okay. I'll leave it out of the manual then next time. Okay. Um, <laughs> so would you 
um, in your in your contract when it's subject to building inspection, would you include that like acceptable repair cost or something no. in there at all? Just subject to building and pest inspection. It's just saying that it's subject. It's, it's not saying you make that decision or they make the decision. It's subject to the building and pest inspection. So that's fine. So you could make it a yeah. decision. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted that. to be really, if you wanted to I mean, obviously be safe, um, safe or as detailed as you can. So if you wanted to say to the satisfactory completion of a building and pest inspection, that's fine as well. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Was there a question at the back? Yep. <coughs> Mike at the back, please. Sheree, I believe in some states that the building, um, the building and pest in the pest inspection is actually done. I believe that that's in maybe Tasmania or somewhere. I'm not sure, and I have heard that it's going to be coming into New South Wales. That that's actually done. That so that each person looking at the property doesn't have to keep going and getting their own inspections done. Do you As know part of the that? selling process yes. for the vendor? That would be nice, wouldn't it? See, I wouldn't. I'd want to still get my own, thinking they've done some dodgy deal with a friend or whatever. That's just me being paranoid. Um, but if that came in, that's great. Um, it's great and that's actually not so great. It's not good for you as renovators because you actually want to buy the properties where there's lots of problems that can be fixed. Um, so if a vendor was to get a building inspection done, they're obviously going to fix those problems before they put the property on the market. So I sort of hope that doesn't come in. Did I hear you correct that you say you can buy the inspection report off someone else? Yeah, sometimes if the if for example if I undertook a, a building and pest inspection, sometimes um, you can ask the the agent if the other party will actually sell you a, like give you a copy of that, sell you a copy of that. I mean, what you ask for a discount price, obviously. I just negotiate with them. Yeah. Because it cuts out the time. The 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 pest inspector probably wouldn't like that. Or what you can do is you can actually um, maybe even find out who did the building and pest inspection. So most, vend most people will say no, go get your own, um, but sometimes you can buy a copy. I've been offered that by agents before. You can buy a copy from the other people, the other party that have bought a copy. Particularly if they're not interested, <laughs> they're more than willing to get recoup 200 bucks back in cost. Hello. Uh, sh hi, Sherry. Uh, just in addition to that, um, uh, building inspection to be done by the vendor. I've tried that in uh, in Melbourne, and I was actually told that it's illegal to for the owner to organise the building inspection themselves. Are you aware of that? No, it doesn't sound right. Because I spoke to the um, agents and I said, look, um, has the bu building inspection done? And they said, no, do you want to get a building ins inspection done? I said, should the owner do it? And they said, look, it's in illegal in Victoria to, for the owner to do that. Never heard of that. It doesn't sound right. I mean, people have to have basically buying a hundreds of thousand dollars asset, I want to be engaging my own building inspector to give me 100% assurity that somebody's not doing some dodgy deal with their, their friend of a friend who's a building inspector. So it doesn't sound right to me. I've certainly never heard of that. We'll certainly investigate that for you. So Julie, um, would you just put that down as an action task to check building inspections in Melbourne? Yeah, anybody from, um, we've got some Melbourne people here. Um, ever heard of that, guys? Do, do, it's, it is a conflict of interest. So I doubt that it's correct. But... Um, yeah. 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 Do your own. I would always do my own. Yeah. Okay, does the property have any old leaking plumbing gas pipes? Now, um, you might come in as cosmetic renovators. You're going to tart up this house. You're going to come in and put new fixtures and fittings in. Just got to be mindful, the extremely old houses are probably going to have old pipes, um, old plumbing lines and gas pipes. When you go and put these old fix uh, these brand new fixtures and fittings, um, quite often they, the appliances will start tripping out because you were, you're trying to match a new appliance with an old system. So just be conscious of that as part of your property due diligence because to replace Place plumbing pipes and electrical lines can be an expensive task. Okay, um, electrical wiring, so same issue there. Does a the property have electrical wiring? This is all the stuff that you ask your building inspector to check for you, okay? So don't just let your building inspector go willy-nilly. Um, say to them, well, some of the things I specifically want you to, to look at are basically structural cracking, um, electrical lines, and basically the plumbing lines throughout the property, in addition to everything else you normally look at. I was going to say, uh, in terms of... Maybe I should do a template for that. Julie? In terms of having all these problems, <laughs> it's beneficial for renovators... should just become a full-time template, template creator. <laughs> okay. It's beneficial for us renovators to have all those problems because yep. you're going to knock off... Absolutely. 
Absolutely. The back half of the house, you go, fantastic. That's exactly right. And that, sorry, that you just led me to another point. So as, a, as cosmetic renovators, always get building and pest inspection. Now, as structural renovators, you can get away with a building and pest inspection because the reality is, is that if I'm coming in as a structural renovator, let's say this is the house here, and we're looking at it, this is the, you know, the front door right here and this is the hallway through there. The reality is if I'm coming in as a structural renovator and I'm going to lop off that anyway and that's all going to be demolished and I'm only keeping the front two bedrooms at the rear, then I'm taking away 80% of the property anyway. So then I'm going to be reinstalling brand new. So the, issue, the, the problems there is that for me it's not worth doing a building and pest inspection if I'm going to be demolishing a large portion of the house anyway. So you've just got to use common sense as to when you do and you don't. But typically any property as a straight cosmetic reno, you're not going, you, you always get a building and pest inspection. It's worth the three to five hundred dollars. Okay. Um, timber rot. Timber rot is basically timber that is um, deteriorating as a result of um, weather exposure, water exposure. So just do a visual check over that. Again, it's a problem that um, is easily fixed, but there is a cost associated with that. Um, one thing that you want to be doing, one thing that you want to be doing when your property inspection, when you're going and doing that property inspection internally, externally, is just looking at all the gutters and the downpipes to make sure that they're not deteriorated. Most properties are fairly good, but the older the property and the more derelict, the more issues. And so again, there is a cost associated with that. So these costs, when you can see visually these things, they're just, it's a signal for you to build, allocate at least some money in your financial feasibility to getting these rectified. Okay, do your homework on the surrounding neighbours. We've all heard the stories, horror stories about the, the neighbours from hell. So, you know, just try and sort of suss this out. If your neighbour next door has, you know, um, cars with the wheels off, on, you know, jacked up on bricks next door um, and looks like it's been there a while, then you've got to put yourself in the buyer's shoes. They're going to be going, yeah, great house, great unrenovated house, but look at the crap next door. So, you know, you've seen those things on TV, like old ladies who've had rubbish, their whole front yards become rubbish tips, and you see the newspaper articles from time to time about the neighbours from hell. So just quick visual check to make sure that neighbours on either side are quite good. Um, do a company search. Sometimes you're going to buy some properties that are under the ownership of a company structure. So if you're doing that, you just want to make sure that um, all is legit with that company, that they're not about to go bankrupt or any, any sort of quirky things like that. So just be careful of that. Um, some properties are also very difficult to obtain finance. Can you think of properties that might fit that description? Yeah, company titles. So there's all different titles of legal ownership. Um, uh, that is in one of the slides coming up. But yeah, company title. Oh, yep, uh, yep, and strata and all that sort of stuff. Um, also, regional properties are quite hard to get rural properties. So those people who are going to be targeting the country areas, you just want to basically be speaking to um, my finance expert or your own finance person just to make sure that you, it's going to be easy for you to get finance for that particular property. Any properties, a country town, properties right in the country towns are typically okay. It's when you start to move out, you know, in that, that um, where land becomes a little bit more available. When there's available land, then they sort of get that regional, that rural tag. And as renovators, you know not to go to those properties anyway, okay? So just be mindful of that. And small units, yes. Um, so studios, yeah, exactly. So be careful. Anybody that's looking at renovating in Potts Point, where there's a lot of um, you know, inner city locations, where there's a lot of very small apartments, you've got to be extremely careful of that as well. Yep, commercial, resident, um, mixed-use zoning, all those sorts of stuff. Um, you've got to be careful, yeah, because one, one of the properties that we bought was a block of um, nine units in Newtown, and it was a residential block. It was actually just a big house that had been sort of chomped on into nine individual units. It wasn't strated, it was just one whole building. Um, and they, because it was nine individual tenancies, they had put a commercial, um, an informal, the banks, even though it was zoned residential, they said this is commercial finance. That meant we had to actually tip in 30% um, rather than 20% deposit. So for some of you, you may not have that extra 10%, and that's where you could get tripped up. Cherie, I just wanted to make an observation. When you were talking earlier about um, experts' reports, yep. whether it's a building inspector or whoever, if you go and buy the report from somebody else, you need to make sure that it doesn't have a disclaimer at the end saying, 
that it's only applicable to that person because it's a basic yes. control. Absolutely. So you've got no legal comeback. That's no, right. None at all. Yep. So that's another, uh, another thing. So in that regard, you might say, look, it's not worth saving the 200 bucks. Um, so yeah. So what, so what she's saying is, sorry, what you're saying is um, that if you do buy a copy of somebody else who's organised a copy and there happens to be a defect that the building and pest inspector hasn't picked up, then you've got no legal comeback to them to make a claim. So for example, if you buy a property and it's got asbestos in it, highly toxic asbestos, and the, and the um, building inspector didn't pick that up, then legally you can make a claim on their professional insurance because they failed, they were negligent in their duties in identifying it. The only exception there is sometimes they can't get access to a particular area, like a subfloor area or a roof space, or they might not be able to see something because there was wardrobes part, you know, put over the wall. So in those instances, there'll be a disclaimer that they'll have a condition saying access could not be granted to this, this and area. So that's where you can get a little bit tripped up. But basically anything they miss that they could clearly see, you can make a claim on their professional insurance. Okay, um, check if the property is insurable. Sometimes you're going to come across unrenovated houses that have just sat in suburbs um, that have been vacant for quite some time. Have you ever seen that? Vacant houses in your suburb. So when a vacant house is vacant for more than three months, it becomes uninsurable. So for you as renovators, you want to make sure that you can get insurance. So problem that's easily solved, you basically just put somebody in there, um, but you just got to be mindful of that, okay? Um, know the hidden costs associated with the property, so things like land tax, strata fees, um, if you're going to be renovating apartments you're going to have strata fees, insurances, so make sure that you're aware of these sorts of things before. Quite often now the real estate agents will actually publish what the hidden costs are associated with the properties. Um, if you like I'll pass one of my magazines around that actually show that to you. So in my area they do publish that. Uh, okay, legal due diligence. Now when you actually go and a, buy, you're looking at buying a property, there's a couple of things that your solicitor or your lawyer conveyancer will need to check. You don't, the good thing is guys, you don't really need to know about these sorters or become an expert because at the end of the day, you're going to be passing all of these things to your experts. So I don't know everything about legal, I, don't, I certainly don't know, I don't know a lot of stuff about tax, even still to this day Darren talks to me, he might as well be talking a foreign language because it's all mumble jumble, but you know what, I don't need to know about it. that's why I'm paying him money to actually do it for me. But it's good to be aware of some of the legal due diligence things that your solicitors will do. So what you, when you're buying a property you want to make sure it's um, compliant in terms of no illegal building works have been built on that property. Um, quite often people just tack on things over the years, um, you know Nanny and Poppy are, are famous for doing this, where they've just been living in that house for 50 years and they've tacked on a sunroom. Look at my dad, you know, classic example. So, um, you know, he's dealing with two properties that aren't even approved. So, what you want to do is it's called a 149 certificate. So, when you put a vendor puts a house up for sale, most councils now will require a 149 certificate in the contract to basically say that, you know, it's, it's met some certain conditions. And if you want, I think you can actually engage council to come out. You can actually, as the, as the buyer, engage them to come out and do a 149 certificate where they actually inspect the property to make sure there's no illegal works. Um, sometimes, what councils do, sometimes you're going to buy a property where there are illegal works. And basically, if you buy the property, uh, look, it can go either way. They typically say that any works that were done before, I think it's 1970 or 1968 or something, somewhere around there, any works that were done illegally, they just let them go now. So, um, sorry? Five years? Okay, great. So you can get away. So typically when you buy a property, what's there is there. It's good for you because um, as renovators, Quite often you'll have this really bad uh, extension. I'll give you an example. One of the properties I bought in Smith Street, Balmain, it was a great one. I, I absolutely loved it. I made good, really good money on it. It was about 400 grand. Um, oh, shit. Okay, I almost went through the floor. Sorry. Did I say shit? Okay. <laughs> All right. Lucky I didn't say my normal word, which is the F one. Okay. <laughs> you would have thought, gee, that sweet girl image just went out the door. All right. I bought a... Um, Checklist to myself, template, do not push whiteboard back too far. All right. One of, the, um, one of the properties that I bought in Balmain, it was a cottage and the actual house, like you could clearly tell where the original workman's cottage was. And what this guy does, it must have had like a very small, like an, an L-shaped extension like that. And what this guy did is over time, he actually, he built an illegal shed here. And then over time, he just got crap. He just got like bits of fibro, bits of tin, bits of plat, like colour bond, all sorts of stuff. And over time, he actually connected the house. 
beautiful one for me. So you walk in this house and you just went, what the? And just, it looked, I called it this one the patchwork house because literally like he actually built walls out of doors and all sorts. So you're going to come across really funny ones, like all sorts of, pro- and this is actually the real fun side of renovating where you just go through these properties and everybody walks in and you see the buyers like running out going, ah, <laughs> like this. And you walk in and you go, oh yeah. So, um, you know, because they, they, people just freak out and they just go, oh, too hard basket. Like I don't even know where to start. So the people freak out. But this is like, you've got to really be willing to take on these properties. So these ones you make absolute great money on. So what he did is he basically t- patched on all this illegal building work over time. And in fact, it sort of even, st- it was more like that. Like that was probably like a, you know, very small extension to the rear. So what I was able to, and had a, a tiny little courtyard. So this courtyard was only about, you know, eight metres by about five metres. So not an overly big courtyard, but it was okay. So what I did, I was able to go through. So that's what's called, that now suddenly became, and he did this about 40 years ago. So it was before that 1970. And so when I bought the property, this was all counted as existing building footprint. As a renovator, what I was able to do is I went to the council and I applied for an exempt and complying development application. You know that mini DA that I said to you about yesterday, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, that partial DA? So what I did is I put an application through to basically knock down all of that because it, it was nothing you could work with. didn't even have proper frames, structural frames underneath. So I put an application, I'll get rid of that. I put an application through to put, to basically rebuild that. In fact, I actually... I actually knocked it off there, so I knocked it off there. I put an application through to build an extension. Through there, so it meant that I was able to get um, bedroom one there, bedroom two there, hallway. I got a bathroom there, so that was a bath. I got bedroom three there. I got um, a dining room there. Oh, that's actually sort of like a study sort of thing. I put a big galley kitchen through there. So a massive eight metre kitchen through there. This became the lounge room through here. So it was a big lounge room. And then I actually put a um, bedroom for a guest bedroom and an ensuite through there. And I got that through council in nine days under complying development because I didn't actually see how I didn't change the building. <laughs> see? Oh, I like that one. So I didn't actually change the building footprint. See that? So that's where, that's where complying development is beautiful. The neighbours didn't even get notified. So because in complying development, they don't get notified. So nobody objected. I had neighbours coming up saying to me, you need development approval for this house. Why are you renovating? And I said, I actually have already got development approval. I got a complying development approval. So that's, if, you can look, if you can work within the existing, ex- existing building footprint, that's beautiful. As renovators, um, so that's, what, that's the beauty of complying development. You are allowed to knock down. You are allowed to replace like for like. Um, and you can go a little bit above. So um, with exempt complying, they would only let me put in individual French doors. Um, they couldn't be any more than two metres wide. So during the inspection, and this is why sometimes it's good to deal with council as your private certifier, um, they, I knew that they wouldn't allow me to put a big set of bifold doors, which would be much nicer to the courtyard. So when the council inspector came out, I said, I worked my charm, and I said, um, look, is it possible? Look, it's, it really doesn't make sense to have these individual doors. Is it possible that I could just put one big set of bifold doors? And he goes, yeah, I don't see any issue. Why not? ticked it off, so I've got a big buy set of buy file doors. So you can send Quinn sort of, look at that can go either way, they'll say no, stick to the plans. But if you get a good one, try and um, get some things. And that's why you like, when those, when those council inspectors come out, you have to make them your new best friend. So say, look, I'm about to order a coffee, do you want one? So again, little things that make a big difference. Okay, um, check what type of um, property ownership your property has. So there's strata title, there's company title, there's community title, there's old system title. There's all sort of different types of property ownership when you buy a property. And you don't have to get too worried about this because your, uh, your solicitor will basically take care of this for you. But you don't just want to be, look, what you want to aim for is in an ideal world, you want to aim for Torrens title. That is the most beautiful ownership because whoever buys that house owns it in its entirety. When you go strata title, you own the individual unit, but you don't own the building, so you're subject to more controls. Um, Company title is basically a different type of title again. Now, the problem is if you're going to be selling your renovated property under a company title, 
buyers will actually come and see that. Their solicitor, they'll say, yeah, I want to buy your house, but then they'll go to their lawyer and the company say, well, it's company title, and they won't understand it, and they'll think, oh, it's too complex, and they'll say they'll bail out of the deal. So just be careful. I'd be inclined not to buy a property that's company title unless you can change it. Have you heard about these 99-year um, lease structures? Yep. That you, they're predominant in the rocks area as well. Yeah. Do you know much about those? Oh, look, I haven't ever bought a property that's under a 99-year lease. Um, for, it can go either way. Look, people are going to say, look, I'm not going to be here in 99 years. High chance I'm not going to be, so what do I care? Um, and you know what? If all of the suburb is like that, then that is fine. Because they either, they either live in that suburb or they don't. So if it's co very common in your particular suburb, it's fine. But some people look, just won't like it. Yeah. You, I mentioned, uh, well, you mentioned earlier about the, de uh, the Department of Housing. There is a large yep. amount in that Millers Point area. And as yep. they're um, coming off the books, they're actually selling them privately yep. now under these 99-year yep. um, leases. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether I would. I don't know. It, I, I guess if it's the norm, I would. If it wasn't, I wouldn't. Sorry. In the ACT, it's all 99-year lease. Okay, cool. So it's and, norm there. And, and it changes over. When you buy it, you get a 99-year lease. Yeah. So oh, there you go. That's, so that's nothing. nothing. It's just that the government owns yep. that land forever. Manly has that as well, and they're like $20 million houses. Okay. So there you go. So non-issue. Yep. Okay, review the title of a property. Um, so you need to make sure who is the legal owner of the property. So again, your uh, solicitor will do this for you, so don't freak out in too much detail. Check the easements of the property. Now, guys, pay attention to this because this is really important. Um, basically, easements are like plumbing lines and things, uh, sewage lines that run through your property. In most properties, um, you know, you've got your, your properties, if you're a bird looking down on, the, on an aerial view of properties, let's say you've got your properties all through there like that. These are the other houses in the street. That's the roof. Um, what you want to aim for, a lot of easements sort of um, ducktail across the back of the property like that, and that's fine. Sometimes, though, you can get um, easements that sort of do this sort of thing, like run through. You might have another property at the back there. Sometimes they run that way. Sometimes they go right through the guts. Sometimes they cut across like that, or sometimes they'll go, you know, from one side, and they'll go, they'll go like that, and they'll... They'll ducktail in somewhere because basically they're, they're trying to marry up with storm, light, storm water lines and things like that. Now, as a renovator, you might come in and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to do a big structural renovation and it's, uh, you're going to do this big alteration addition right through the rear there and basically you've got those lines. Now, again, it's a solvable problem. You can move that, but it's very, very expensive. I don't know if you've ever heard of things like concrete encasing and stuff like that. It can rack up some huge costs. So when you have got your legal contract, when you get the contract to sale from the agent, just have a quick look at the survey and just see if you can see any of those obvious issues. So if the lines are, so what you want to aim for is you want to aim for the lines to be at the back because you're not going to be building there anyway or you want to, in an ideal world, aim for them to sort of be running down um, the sides of the property where you're not going to be doing any sort of um, major building works. You've also got to be careful of that, like when you're doing little things like paving and stuff like that, just to be conscious of where those lines run. All right. Um, are there any covenants? Now, covenants um, are basically restrictions on a property that re, um, stop you from doing certain things. For example, in Melbourne, all the Melbourne people, there's a lot of building and heritage overlays in, the, in some suburbs of Melbourne, which means that you can't. You might want to paint your house uh, green, or you might want to paint it whatever, yellow, whatever the colour may be, but the council in that area will only have a certain palette of colours that you are allowed to paint your properties. So that's called a covenant um, and you have to be aware of whether... So where are you going to get that information from? Council. council. Julie's, can you add that to my list? Um, caveats. Now, caveat is a restriction that somebody has put on the property um, in terms of being sold. You don't have to really worry about this too much, but it's something to be aware of. Sometimes people put a caveat, so they can go into a courthouse and they can put a caveat on the property that they have some sort of vested interest in. Um, quite often, you know, husbands and wives or whatever, if the, if, if the wife uh, is not on the title, she could go into the judge and say, look, my husband's about to sell the house and, and squander the money or whatever, and the judge will actually grant a caveat. Sometimes trade tradies can even do this now. If you're owed money, they can go into a local courthouse and actually put a caveat on your property for undue money, all sorts of things. So you just want to make sure your lawyer will pick this up, but you want to make sure there's no caveats on a property. Okay, uh, review the services plan. So um, that's the services plan I just spoke about. Okay, so they're pretty much all the due diligence things. So I've summarised those for you on the property due diligence. I know it sounds exhausting, but it's actually not. That whole process, step number three, because the reality is,
is if that process is going to take you a week, you're going to miss out on deals. So when a good deal comes on the market, you need to act very quickly. Don't do your head in going through the manuals. Basically, go just drag out the property inspection, uh, property due diligence checklist, and it's just all summarised for you. You go tick, tick, I've done my council search, tick, I've checked there's no contamination, tick, I've done that, I've... Um, it's no building heritage, no caveats, legal due diligence, tick, tick, tick. Once you've got everything ticked, then you can basically say, yeah, I've researched thoroughly, I'm not going to buy a lemon, and then we're going to move to step number four. Any questions on property due diligence? Just on the easements, yes. um, there was a property I was looking at a little while ago, and... Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> and basically, it was a renovator's delight, I loved it, and I thought, great, got my family involved, we were looking at it, and it did have an easement. There was no garage, no anything. And we thought, oh, we could build that, put a carport, whatever. Yeah. And I decided to contact the town planner. And he came out and took a look and went, don't do it because you're going to have to give council permission. Mm -hmm. If there's a leak, if there's anything else, you're going to have to rip everything up. And the agent would say, no, no, you can build on it, you can build on it, it's all OK. So you've really got to check and ask the town planner even about the easements yep. because would have cost me thousands. <clears throat> okay, yep. And in step number six, um, normally, um, and that's the case, if you're doing a structural renovation, then certainly you can engage a town planner. Your architect will pick up a lot of that as well. And if you're doing a cosmetic reno, it's not a non-issue, but absolutely, yep. Um, just be careful, guys. When you're out doing, I see it all the time, and it really annoys me. Um, all the time you're going to go to your open for inspections, I see agents say to unsuspecting buyers, particularly young couples, they say, oh, you should be able to get a second story on this house. You see, you see it's subject to council approval. So in the marketing brochures, you see STCA. Have you ever seen that? I know full well that you're never ever and it really annoys me that um, agents m blindly mislead people like that so you just have to know what's fact from fiction when you are buying a property. I've, a, I've put some script, scripts in your due diligence, uh, in your template, scripts, scripts, uh, in your disc and um, so with the, you've got a letter there for door knocking. So basically I'll give you a quick example of door knocking. You don't go up to somebody's house and say, hey, I want to buy a house. I want to renovate it and make a mozza from it, okay? That's not really the right way to approach things. Um, so what I do is I basically like, will walk into somebody's house that I say, don't be afraid to do this. Um, in fact, I actually went to Adelaide. I had half a day to kill. I was speaking on a Sunday morning. I flew in on a Saturday afternoon. Had a few hours to kill, so I actually spent some time with one of my students um, who was looking for some deals. And I said, well, why don't we spend you know, an hour or two going, going door knocking? And she goes, yeah, love it. Okay, so anyway, I dragged her to this house. I said, this is a great house right here. So I wanted to open up her eyes to the possibilities. Anyway, I went to door knock and she was like hiding behind the bush. <laughs> I'm like, come here. Okay, so you know, you knock on the door. I always say, hi, I'm always very polite to them. I say, hi, my name's Sheree. I'm sorry to disturb you. I always say that straight up front. I say, look, I'm actually looking to buy some house in this particular suburb. I don't really want to deal with the agents. I particularly love this street and I was walking in up and down this street and I absolutely love your house. Is there any chance that you would be potentially potentially interested in selling your property to me. That is a much nicer way of going up to somebody and, hey, I want to, are you interested in selling your house? Because they're going to go, who are you? Are you a developer? Are you what? Are you a real estate? They'll automatically assume you're a real estate agent. So sorry, I also say that. I say, hi, my name's Sheree. Look, I'm not a real estate agent. I'm really sorry to bother you. I really love this suburb. I really want to buy a house in this suburb. I particularly love this street and I saw your house. I fell in love with it. Is there any chance I could buy this house off you? Are you interested in selling? Even if they're not interested in selling, give them your, what card are you going to give them? Your blank card, your personal card with no company details. You say, look, um, Beryl, is it okay that, look, if something changes, <laughs> you'll be Beryl. <laughs> Beryl, if there's any chance that your, your, your situation changes and you will be selling, um, here's my card. Would you please give me a call because I love your house. People's situations change. I've left those cards at people's house and two years later I've got a phone call saying, hey, you came through, my, you knocked on my door two years ago, I wasn't interested in selling but I'm actually interested in selling now, do you want to, you want to have a chat? So sometimes they, those deals, I've been able to buy deals that way by door knocking. So there's a script there for you, exactly what I've just said, the script's there, so you know, rehearse it and you know, practice it. There's also a script there for um, letterbox drops, so get into the habit of letterbox dropping. Um, just to give you an idea, one of my students actually... Um, 
went to the quick copy shop. She ran off 5,000 copies and she basically letterbox dropped every single house in Leichhardt. She was ringing me up. She said, oh, Sheree is killing me, like walking around the streets. It's killing me. I said, why don't you get smart about your letterbox? Instead of killing yourself, even though it's great exercise, I said, think creatively about how you can actually get those letters distributed. So I said, why don't you just go up to Balmain Backpackers, hire some backpackers for $100 a day, get two or three of them, cost you 300 bucks, you're done. So she went and did that. So she let her box drop 5,000 homes and she got nine phone calls. And she ended up, doing a, ended up buying a $3 million house with none of her own money, where she did a joint venture. So it's a numbers game. So don't expect to, let it, don't expect to door knock every single house. Don't expect to get a response from every single um, house that you put the letter in. Um, my experience is, is that if you actually handwrite the letter, like any really hot deals, where, how properties where you're desperate to buy that house, handwrite the letter because a handwritten response always at least gets a personal phone call from the owner. Even if they're not interested in selling, they'll look, hi, um, hi name Shereen, my name's Beryl. Look, you actually wrote me a letter in my letterbox. I'm just ringing to let you know I'm not actually interested in selling. I'll say, no problems, Beryl. Look, thank you. I appreciate the call. Um, if something changes, can you please give me a call because I would love to buy your property. So I've just find the personal handwritten letter because nobody takes time to write the handwritten letters now. So if you can do that, you'll, you'll good chance of getting a response. So just quick ways to find deals. Um, obviously, the internet, obviously, your own open for inspection. You're going to get on the top five favourite list of the agents by, by developing the relationships there. Um, walking the streets. And this is the beauty of living in your suburb. If you live in the suburb and you've got a dog or a cat or a ferret that you want to take for a walk, I see some people walking around Balmain. Um, so <laughs> um, my sister being one of them. Um, I'm like, I'm not going for a walk with you at the ferret. Um, so, um, you know, this is where walking the street, you just start looking at the house. This is a great way to learn about the housing styles, like all the quirky little deals. Even now, you know, I've, um, you know, walk around Batman, you still see the deals. So, you know, door knocking, council websites. So you should start monitoring the council. You know that develop an application tracking system that I took you through yesterday? Start jumping on that because people are lodging development applications. And what I would do is I'd be getting in contact with those owners saying, hey, look, I noticed you've got a development application through council. Are you going to be selling it DA approved or is there any chance I can buy it off you once it's development approved? So can you see how it's being proactive? proactive, not reactive, um, the handwritten letters and the door knocking, and just make sure you phone those real estate agents every Wednesday, Thursday. Persistence conquers resistance. Don't, don't give up. Cherie, so once Beryl said, yes, I would maybe sell my house to you, yes. and you've had tea and scones and everything. And the dog licks your face. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you take it from there? What, okay, what's so the process from question? there? Yep, all right. So... Um, I was actually going to talk about this in step number five, but I'll, I'll quickly discuss it now. So basically, if somebody says, yeah, actually, I'm interested in selling my house. Okay, look, um, what you need to do, what I basically say is, look, there's a couple of ways that we can handle this. Um, if you know what you want for the property right now, we can do the deal. If it's subject, you know, you tell me a price, I'm going to tell you whether or not that price works out for me. So you can be straight up. And most people won't do that, though. They'll want to get um, different opinions. So what I say to people, if I'm dealing with Beryl, I say, look, Beryl, if you like, just so you can make sure I'm not trying to do anything dodgy, because um, a lot of older people, the reality is there's a lot of bad people around, and they, they rip grandma off and I, I never want to be anybody like that so I'll say look Beryl um, just to give you peace of mind if you want to organize a value your own independent valuation from a licensed valuer please go and organize it and I send get them to send the invoice to me and I will pay the invoice for you so I don't ever say to them look I'll organize a valuer because what's Beryl going to assume doing some backhand deal with my friend who's a valuer. So I was going to say, go get your own independent valuation, get them to send the invoice to me, I will pay for that. Now, with, when that valuation comes in, Beryl, you know, obviously you tell me what price you want for the property based on that valuation, and I'll tell you whether or not I'm happy to pay that for you. I think that's the best way of negotiation because, um, and I actually learned this from somebody that I did business with a few years ago, and I thought, he's actually really smart in the way he negotiates. Because how I was negotiating in my early days, I would be imposing my conditions on them, and it's actually better if you come back to the vendor. Instead of you trying to preempt or second guess what the vendor wants, you just say, look, you tell me what you want, and I'll tell you whether I can give it to you rather than you trying to second guess what their conditions, what circumstances they're dealing, what's, what's the stuff behind the scenes that they're dealing with. Um, so, um, 
So do that. Now, what they might, as I say, then Beryl might say, look, I've had a couple of agents on my door and they're telling me I can get a million bucks for my house and it's worth 800000 whatever it may be. Say, so look, Beryl, what we'll do is if you want to go and get... So you never stop them. Never stop them from doing that. Like, obviously, you want to try and, uh, you know, not get it to that point, but don't ever forcefully make them do something. So what I say, look, if you want to do is go to the real estate, go, go to two real estate agents, get them to appraise your property with real factual figures, not made up figures. And then let's go and get the valuation done. You get your own valuer. And do you think Beryl in between the two valuations from the agent and the valuation from the licensed valuer that we could probably strike a figure that we, that we both feel comfortable with? And that's the best way to do business when you're dealing with a private vendor.